Welcome to the World Stage, Nupi's podcast on world affairs. My name is Tor Olav Iversen. Uh, I am a senior research fellow at Nupi. Um, and with me, I also have my dear colleague uh, from Nupi, Professor Cedric de Kunik. But this time, we also have a guest from the outside. Professor Ashok Svein is head of the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University. Professor Svein has written extensively on security challenges, water sharing issues, conflict and peace, and democratic development. He's particularly a leading scholar in the field of environmental peace building and has been appointed a UNESCO war, uh, chair on the international water cooperation. Um, at last, we also have to mention that he is uh, a bit of a celebrity on the social media known as X and previously no known as Twitter. So I would encourage uh, all listeners to follow him there. Um, so it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you to Nupi Ashok um, and the world stage for a talk about how we can build th peace through cooperation on environmental issues. Thank you. So just to start out, uh, because I don't think that this is necessarily like an intuitive connection for everyone. So uh, Ashok, why should we connect uh, the environment to issues of peace and conflict? Environment has been... Um, part of the peace uh, discussion and conflict discussion for a long time. It's not exactly something new, but um, it has been uh, not probably the main connections which we would talk about historically, but uh, there have been, um, environment has been the uh, victim of conflicts for a long period of time. Um, there has been a lot of discussions, debates about it, uh, particularly after the Second World War. But the gradually, those parts that how uh, environment, will be, environment become victim of conflict has come back again in the recent wars in Ukraine and as well as Israel-Palestine conflict and also in conflicts in Ethiopia and Sudan and you name it, that's coming. But also there has been another issue that uh, the... Uh, um, uh, how the environmental resource scarcity can lead to conflicts or uh, disagreements or the um, breakdown of the existing agreements. So that has been uh, in the last 20, 30 years, there has been this debate. But how also environment can lead to peace uh, or the peace, uh, whether we need to, a, a peace is good for environment or bad for environment. That's also another uh, discussion. Of course, uh, most of the debate goes into Peace is good for the environment, but some people say that even there is a conflict, then there is a less development, so the environment will be protected. Uh, in many cases, uh, some of the people give this uh, example of the South Korea, North Korea demilitarized zone as a kind of area where the environment has been protected because a conflict continuing since for the last several years, decades. Um, but I think it is it's also how uh, environmental resources can push people to cooperate. It's an important thing because as we are talking about land, water, forest, those issues and uh, air. And I think that will be once it starts protect, uh, pushing uh, countries and groups to cooperate, to work together, to get more uh, benefits out of these resources, that will lead to you know, possibility of more cooperation in other areas and that will lead to peace. So that's the kind of discussions of the debate which has been going on at least almost 80 years now. Uh, and those kinds of debates are central also to the field of environmental peace building. Yes, environmental peace building, I think, is a, is a much more, uh, more policy side part of how environment can contribute to the peace and the post-conflict reconstruction, post-conflict development, and to uh, n uh, limit the conflict reoccurring again because these are the ideas which is that once the conflict, uh, a violent conflict comes back again. Uh, so that's why how to limit that kind of uh, dangerous possibility. Uh, but the environmental peace building uh, came up with the idea first when it started environmental peacemaking uh, in a much more uh, theoretical way that how the countries or the regions or the groups and the people, those who are so facing the environmental uh, crisis or scarcity, they will cooperate and that will lead to cooperation in other areas. And the environmental peace building is something, uh, draws some of the part from it, 
that how we should make the environment being part of the peace agreement, uh, that it will be all the peace agreements should take into account the environmental factor while they are signing this agreement between the two warring parties or pre-warring parties when they got out of the war. And also how that when the international uh, agencies, uh, organizations, those who are engaged in the uh, reconstructions effort, um, they are taking environment into account. Uh, while these reconstruction processes that the environment is not compromised just in a, a way of that we suddenly change the economic development and that will economic development will bring some kind of stability and we'll get away of it. So you need to keep the environment for a sustainable peace to sustain. And I think this is where uh, environmental peace building is good in that part. But there is, I think, a question comes in when we think of environmental peace building uh, means that we, the cooperation or the peace over the environment will lead to other areas of uh, contentious uh, issues. And I think that's where we might have to look for new way of uh, getting inspirations or the new cases where we can find that we, it, it will justify our argument. Um, so environmental peace building, I guess that's the kind of topic that includes all kinds of environmental issues. But one environmental issue which I think particularly uh, has, uh, has particular importance today in both policy and public discourse is, of course, climate change. And you, Cedric, you've been working um, with some colleagues here at NUPI on specifically issues of climate change and peace and security. So it would be really good if you could just uh, talk a bit about that work, but also try to explain sort of what does climate change have to do with peace and security in general? Thank you very much. And I, I, I think the what Ashok, how Ashok explained environmental peace building uh, and environmental peacemaking is quite interesting also for the way there's now work around the relationship between climate change and peace and security. Because uh, that relationship is very often framed in the sense of climate change being somehow a threat or a risk uh, in some contexts, whereas the peace building approach, I think, help us to think much more in terms of uh, what could be the ways in which cooperation in the management of natural resources that may be you know, under stress as a result of climate change, but how can that cooperation lead to uh, social cohesion, better, stronger social cohesion, build uh, resilience of communities in terms of how they manage uh, that uh, environmental stress. So in that sense, I, I, I think the interlinkage between environmental peace building and the broader field of climate peace and security is very important. And uh, climate peace and security as uh, uh, a field, it has attracted quite a lot of both uh, political and academic attention over the last years. So uh, how is the um, uh, agenda on this uh, on climate peace and security proceeding in different kinds of international forums? Yes, so I think the this field is of course essentially about the interrelationship between climate change and its effects on society and then including its effects on peace and security. Um, I think Generally, especially in the policy space, there's a large number of, of actors, uh, states, international institutions, uh, civil society that uh, are working in this area that see that there is uh, a relationship and that that relationship can be influenced by, for instance, strengthening the capacity of societies or communities to, uh, to manage uh, the disruptions that may, came as, may come as a result of, of climate change uh, or environmental degradation. But there are also some who question the link between climate change and uh, the, its societal impact. Um, so I think in that sense, there's still an ongoing debate about this causal relationship between climate change and its societal impacts. And one way uh, we are dealing with that, and if I say we, I mean NUPI and also our partners, CIPRI, in the specific project that we are working on, is we look at a number of pathways, uh, livelihoods, uh, mobility, uh, the role of armed actors and polite, uh, elite exploitation as ways of, of trying to navigate this relationship between climate change and its social impacts. 
very interesting. And, and as I understand, this uh, issue has also been like rather contentious in some uh, global, uh, very important uh, global bodies on peace and security, like the United Nations Security Council. Yes, uh, in the Security Council, um, this is still an ongoing debate. Uh, on the one hand, the Security Council is increasingly dealing with issues uh, related to uh, the impact that climate change has on peace and security in the sense that there is now a large body of Security Council resolutions that have specific language that direct, for instance, a UN peacekeeping operation to report and to analyze this relationship. But there's also a, a couple of countries that think that this debate should not be in the UN Security Council, that uh, climate change is something that needs to be developed, it needs to be handled rather, in, for instance, uh, the UN process through the UN FCCC or the COP process. So that element is also still an ongoing part of the debate in the Security Council. Thank you. Um, Ashok, when we're talking about the UN, you're actually the UNESCO Chair on International uh, Water Cooperation. Um, and uh, it would be interesting both to hear a bit about your role there in UNESCO, but also um, a bit about the relationship between water, peace and conflict. Yeah, I think uh, mm -hmm. there have been uh, UN, we do expect to play a much larger role, but I think we need to know that there is a lot of limitation UN has. Uh, it's a UN is a very small budget with a large number of players, big players playing the game. Uh, Security Council is highly divided, and I think that has been partly probably my reservations about what Cedric was now saying that uh, uh, the Security Council uh, taking a call on the security matters of the climate change part. Uh, it's not that nobody, nobody, no one questions that the climate change doesn't have impact or that doesn't have a significant impact on the security, but how effective it will be if a security council takes a position. Coming back to the UNESCO, um, I think uh, there has been, uh, not only UNESCO, there have been several organizations, the UN, of course then the UN Water has been created, but the UNDP, UN General Assembly, UN, uh, you name it, there are all sorts of organizations from the, in the within the UN are engaged in the water issues in one way or other. So there are too many cooks uh, and there is very little breath or the little water there to play the game. Um, but I think it, it's, it's a somehow, uh, uh, it is important that the UN coordinates its matter very carefully, it, give it limited resources, but it has a huge significance in the global still, I think, and it has a po huge potential to have the significant impact on these matters, which are transboundary in nature. Uh, and I think uh, coming back to my role as a UNESCO chair on international water cooperation, I think it is more of uh, this is the field we have been working on the international water sharing for more than three decades. It's a very, it's my bread and butter or even bread of the work rather. But I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's some things which I find it's a extremely important uh, that the uh, though it is such an important part of the international relations, peace and conflicts in different parts of the world, regional integration, but it doesn't get that uh, kind of significant uh, um, uh, space in the debate, discussions, uh, diplomacy, because many people dip in diplomatic circles or the politicians don't understand the water and its uh, different uh, components, how that work, because they are not hydrologists, nor they, they have a particular knowledge. So the, once the politicians and diplomats don't understand the water, they of course not able to, you know, they, that's because out to either they highly securitize it or they usually don't really give the importance of this, their policy making. So that's what has been my real concern from the very beginning. And the why the UNESCO, becoming a UNESCO chair gives me a platform in different parts of the world to raise my voice that whenever this situation comes in, I talk to, I, I usually use this uh, title to rather more to influence the public discourse on this matter, that uh, it makes a sense though. I mean, I sometimes play above my uh, height uh, not only in the you know the West, but I think it's a it's somehow to um, give the 
um, voice or the at least the importance, the way I think it should be dealt with, the importance it should get. The people, those who are, because the most of these international waters uh, have been said, the powerful countries, uh, the countries they have really got the, even there is an agreement, they have taken the uh, major share. So they have been more, so I think it's also to argue for the people, those who are in the, the water should be used as an equitable manner. Water should be, not only be a power politics, but also to give in the human security. So those are the things I try to highlight as much as I can do. But I think the UN has to play a major part into it in many ways. I just wanted to clarify, uh, I think uh, something that Ashok said made me realize that perhaps it's important to clarify that when we talk about climate change or the interlinkages between climate change and peace and security and the degree to which that is being discussed in the Security Council, I think we need to distinguish between talking about how to manage climate change, which is something which is being handled in the UNFCCC and through the COP process. So that's about mitigation, about emissions, about the Paris Agreement and so on. Whereas the issues that are being discussed in the Security Council is how climate change may be having an impact on the maintenance of international peace and security in a particular context. And most of what the Security Council deals with then, for instance, through a resolution that it adopts would be an instruction to a UN body like a UN peacekeeping mission or a UN special political mission to take uh, the climate change and its effects on that country into account when it analyzes the conflict or when it reports on the conflict. Or, for instance, you could think about, for instance, the UN peacekeeping operation in South Sudan and there could be flooding and it has a mandate to protect civilians, so then it needs to take into account in its planning how will it be able to reach those civilians that they need to protect despite the flooding. So it's those kind of um, manifestations of climate change that is really the issues that are being debated in the Security Council. Um, to try to summarize a bit, so um, Joachim uh, said that like climate change it does, does affect security, which is also what you're sort of substantiating, Cedric. So climate change it affects uh, like uh, broader secure broadly understood security, meaning both traditional like soft security issues and human security, like food security and water security and women peace and security and those kinds of issues, but also more like hard security and military security, like, like for instance how to conduct a peacekeeping uh, operation or how to run a national military. Um, so just to continue a bit with these water issues, so Cedric, um, do you think that climate change could also uh, result in more conflict and tensions around water resources, like for instance the Nile River Basin? Well, I think on the one hand, we can expect that climate change can further increase scarcity of water and therefore increase tensions around water usage. Uh, but I think if we look at uh, the way in which most uh, transboundary water resources have been managed in the world, we see that this leads is more likely to lead to cooperation or some form of agreement or way of managing that water resource rather than conflict. Um, and that cooperation that comes about in that as a result, you know, could also, as Ashok mentioned earlier, contribute in some cases to broader cooperation in the area. So I, I doubt that uh, climate change in that sense, you know, is going to lead to climate wars. The climate doesn't make war, people make war. So it's about how do we manage the relationship between people in the context of, of managing this scarcity. Uh, I, th I think I completely agree. And I think this is, uh, of course, climate change makes it much more problematic now in some cases to sign the uh, new agreements. Uh, as you, I probably have mentioned before, that in the 90s, we saw major rivers where there was a contention, the con they were signing agreements. And in the last 20 years, there has been less number of agreements. And the Nile, which you mentioned, now, Cedric, it's also the kind of the, um, uh, it's, it's a, the uh, climate change is blocking uh, rather a agreement which is supposed to be easier to sign, as I understand, because the dam which has been built in Ethiopia is a hydropower dam, so it's not really taking away the water from the system. So it's just the con how to manage the water, and that's why climate change brings another added uh, challenge. But the, uh, I think it is more of a 
climate change also creates a little bit of challenge for the existing agreements because uh, the uh, rainfall pattern has changed uh, somehow from different uh, time period to another time period. Also the melting, snow melting in some of the rivers which are they are being affected. So the time of water availability and water demand, the timing has changed. And many water agreements have been signed before which are particular on particular time period how much water you will get so it's but it's just you need to be flexible you need to be the country not we but the countries need to be flexible of how to really readjust their agreements of uh, coming into climate change and being reflective reflexive and um, um, responsive to the climate uh, challenges uh, but I, I, as I say, oh, I think water is too important to fight war for. Uh, it's uh, you, you, because we are extremely dependent on water and water uh, storage and dams and this. And I think uh, we, I think the countries really don't fight on something which they really um, need to survive on. So I think that that's what has stopped many in many cases the war over the water. And I think. Um, I, I don't think that I, I totally agree with Cedric. It's just the politics. If the, if they want to fight a war, they will fight a war. It's not over the climate change and the uh, water issue. And if you do if you do go to war over a water resource, at some point that war stops, and then you still have to manage the the shared water resource. So I think uh, people, you know, go through the calculation and then realize it's better to invest in the diplomacy of managing that shared water resource. Um, I, just, I would like to go a bit more into that. And I know that you, Ash Ashok, you've been working quite a lot with uh, different kinds of water sharing ag agreements, particularly with regards to rivers. So you have, I mean, obviously the, the, Nile, ba the Nile Basin, where there's such an, um, th there's been a framework for uh, cooperation. And then you have the, the Mekong Basin uh, river agreements. And then you also have uh, several agreements in South Asia. So it would be interesting just to hear a bit more about the history of those agreements and also what we can learn from them. Uh, sorry, I know that's a, that's a very broad question. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think these are the rivers which you mentioned. They have certain kind of cooperation or agreements. Schemes started in the 90s. It was immediately after the uh, in the post-Cold War period. So there was a lot of hope for bringing the end of the conflicts in those regions and creating water as a source of cooperation. Because in many of these basins, only river was flowing, nothing else between the countries. And I think that was the reason why there was a lot of focus. And in the Mekong, as you mentioned, there have been four lower Mekong, Mekong riparian countries um, have established Mekong River Commission. Uh, this is was also supported by mostly uh, countries, uh, European countries and Canada and uh, US sometimes support and that has been a point of contention by China. China and Myanmar are not really part of that agreement. But that has developed also not only the cooperation among the four lower Mekong riparian countries, whether those cooperations are really internal driven or externally uh, external interest because of course we are putting a lot of resources there. Um, so externally that would mean? Uh, Foreign, uh, Western countries. Western countries putting a lot of resources there um, and then particularly managing MRC, Mekong River Commission and organizations and others. But also it has developed a lot of cooperation between China and Myanmar despite China building dams on the, the Mekong uh, upstream. So it's, 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 it has been cooperation in many ways, but it is a very, it's, 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 a, it's some things which is, a, um, again, comes back, there is a also local regional cooperation building in other areas. Whereas in the Nile, Nile 99, there was a, a agreement or the kind of Nile River Basin Initiative. It's a World Bank which really did it uh, or started this process and made it. But I think it was a, uh, it was a it, it was a good thing to do it to look at all the river basins as a unit and to try to find a cooperation but they didn't really get it that the sorry, the, 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 the problem was with which was that the Nile river basin though it's a one river basin but it has two river basin in all practical purposes only becomes one river basin from Khatum to uh, down the sea but I think uh, because it's a white Nile and blue Nile and white Nile has its own um, because it's mostly water management, how that will be creating more dams for the electric consumption. But we are here. The 86, 87 percent of water comes from the Blue Nile Basin, and that's Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. 
And the, they didn't real, they thought that if you bring 10 countries together, then you will get an agreement. And that really didn't work out well because the real problem is Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan on the Blue Nile, which is the major water. And I think this is the discussion which we have been now. Ethiopia has built a bigger dam. So that is Ethiopia has already in the four years it's been um, uh, putting the water into this, uh, the, uh, filling up the reservoir. The dam is there to stay. So it is now how to find a cooperation given the climate change. I think it is going again. Um, it really, in two years back, there was a major, major discussions that they will be going for a war, but that hasn't taken place. W was that Egypt? Egypt was uh, um, basically uh, threatening a war uh, against Ethiopia, uh, and the particularly international media, and media was also being very much uh, into this, that uh, there will be a water war there. But it has it, this water war in the Nile Basin is not a new thing. It has been going on for so the Egypt has been always threatening it. But it is very difficult now to do a war on that one and on all other wars. In South Asia, I think is a, South Asia is a is a is a case also. You see, if you look at all this, there have been always these are the traditional superpowers or the traditional regional powers like in Mekong in China, but then smaller ones like Thailand and Vietnam, and then in this case in the Nile, there is a Egypt always, and then the Ethiopia come up, and the India, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, or Nepal in the South Asia, most of this river comes from them. This used to be the India's field. I, I'm not getting into this deep uh, into this, but it has been India used to be the main power because China was not really using those uh, rivers before. Um, particularly the Brahmaputra part of Ganges and part of Indus comes from China. They were not using because that was time that weren't economically developed. So India was the upstream country in all power powerful purposes and using the water mostly. Though of course in Nepal and Bhutan they were upstream countries but they were under India's uh, direct influence those days. So I think it was going on. But now China has become a major contention or major party. Whereas India has signed an agreement with Pakistan since 1960, India has a, a, a signing a, signed an agreement since 96 on the Ganges. Um, those agreements are not really leading to real cooperation or water cooperation or something, but it has brought down conflicts on the water to a large extent, to a big extent. But I think what really makes it interesting now, or interesting for the people like, if you are peace and conflict researcher, the China's emergence as a major, major actor replacing India as the water superpower in that, in that basin. So once China has become the upstream powerful country and you building number of dams in the Brahmaputra upstream, some in the Ga in Ganges, some in the Indus. And I think the power structure has changed quite dramatically in that sector. So I would, I would, I have been suggesting that uh, if uh, it's exactly like how Mekong to draw, sorry, I'm, I'm probably speaking a bit longer, but I think how to, how to draw the successful case of cooperation from Mekong. Because Mekong here, the four lower Mekong riparian countries have cooperated. They have, because they are four countries, China, Myanmar, despite China's reluctance, has become a party because it's, a, it's a more than the water. It needs also the market, it needs the economy, it needs the cooperation of four countries. So I'm arguing for India's benefits. India needs to start cooperating at least with Nepal, Bhutan, because Pakistan is a special case. But in but uh, to Bangladesh, Nepal, and uh, Bhutan, create a four uh, country like a similar like Lower Mekong River Commission type, and then on that basis negotiate with China. So you will have a better power play into negotiating with China. But of course, there have been some intention, but it's not been die because of the internal problems. But I think the similarly, there have been also the Indus case, because in the Indus case, if you look at it, it's a India, Pakistan, but there are two other, other riparians are there. There's China as well as uh, Afghanistan. So I think if really we want to make peace out of Indus and make long-term thing, I think the 1960 agreement, as I find it, it's been outlived its utility. 
they need to four countries come together, create a kind of river commission because Pakistan is extremely dependent on the water and also India. Indians were part of the Punjab and Haryana, those states are extremely dependent. So I think it's, a, it's a, but I, you need all this. I mean, I don't think people are not aware of this situation and emerging climate change, which is creating much more challenges in these areas, number of floods, which they could really control the Pakistani flood if they can build dams upstream. But they cannot build the dams because of the agreement which is existing. So there are a number of ways they understand the benefits of it. But it's the, the lack of trust, uh, the politics in the region, the power politics among the countries, that's what has been the problem. So in a world of dramatically increased geopolitical tensions, uh, is it possible for cooperation on climate change and environmental issues to contribute to positive change at the level of great power politics? Yes, I think it is. Uh, it is uh, somehow, um, this is not far from any kind of ideas or it's something not very new that the countries haven't cooperated. And I have a strong belief that the, uh, it is uh, the countries and the people, we know how to uh, come together when there is a real need for it. Uh, that hope should be there. I'm no way taking away that hope, despite a lot of hopeless situation we are in now. Uh, I think it is, again, uh, of course, we are getting into a rough political weather globally, uh, particularly among the key countries, those who have been. But I think there is a general, there are a few things which we need to look at positive side. The agreement in 2015, the Paris Agreement, it is something, an extraordinary effort of countries coming together, at least able to sign an agreement where agreeing that they will you know, reduce the emissions. There has been always this, uh, you know, even though there has been less money for the loss and damage fund, there was all kinds of negotiation taking longer period of time. It is a positive move to some extent. Of course, we are not happy the way the speed it has been taking, the way this, but given the political situation globally, given the kind of uh, a lack of trust or the particular the way things are moving it, in that climate change still remains as a significant uh, point of discussions debate and uh, globally people are considering it's a high risk issue i mean if you look at the now um, world economic forums that is climate change is uh, highest risk uh, so people do uh, are aware and the policy making are aware that what kind of risk it is but i think it is it's just a matter of time hopefully there will be uh, again i i think i will keep a hope that the mankind is uh, uh, has done in the past and hopefully they will not miss this particular time to come up to the um, occasion and do the right thing. I, I agree with Ashok. I think we just need to be realistic about the scale of the agreement we can expect. I think what we've seen is that at, at regular critical intervals, there has been breakthroughs, there has been agreements, uh, there has been cooperation. But at the same time, uh, I'm doubtful that, you know, we're going to have uh, some kind of a magical moment where the, the major powers come together and, uh, and agree on a, on a brilliant uh, set of, of, you know, things to implement. Uh, but th the more important question that we have seen, or the more important point, is that there has been steady progress uh, and there has been agreements, there's been no breakdown. There has been agreements and, and every one of the COPs, uh, although many of us would like to see even further and, and more movement, but there has been a steady progress if we look throughout the history of the COP processes. Um, that's a very hopeful and uh, nice tone to strike now that we're wrapping everything up. So just for as a quick uh, like end, um, last question, I would like to ask you, so what, what question do you think that we as a researcher should focus on, on in, in this nexus of environment, climate change and water and peace and conflict in the coming years? I think the first thing we need to, to research and spend more fo research focus on is understanding better exactly what are the kind of resilience and adaptive capacities that societies need to manage the disruption that come from climate change. And then the second thing would be, you know, how do we mobilize global cooperation, international cooperation behind strengthening those capacities? To me, those are the two most important research questions. I agree with the policy side that those are the supposed to be, uh, I mean, the researchers should need to figure out how that the helpful policy side. But uh, one thing I will add uh, with that one is that to uh, find good cases and bad cases. 
uh, we need a very solid research, as a research community, to show that how, we, what, what has been successful, what hasn't been successful. And I think we will only able to make good policy if we have good cases too. Of course, I'm not saying that we can superimpose one thing on another because every society, every case is, has its uniqueness. But of course, we need, we have a lot of, nothing is unique in that sense. Uh, so there is a lot of things to learn from others. So I think there is a still we are missing in, 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 in this way that which cases are really good cases and the solid cases where we can draw the conclusion. Uh, and for the bad cases, what kind of mistakes we have made and we shouldn't make. And then the, I think uh, another thing, particularly on the uh, water and the environment issue and the climate issue, there is a lot of uh, uh, disconnect goes on between the research which has been done on environmental issue and there is a climate researchers don't understand the environment research which has been done in the 80s and 90s. And I think how to connect that and what are the because they give, for example, the climate refuge research, if you look at it, they don't talk about environmental refuge research, which we used to do in the 90s. And there is a number of uh, um, uh, learning is there. And I think also to connect it, the climate research with the environment research, because otherwise we are missing out a number of things. So I think it's a build on something, what has happened to analyze it well, and to learn from the history and to think about the future. Thank you very much. I think we could go on for quite a while, but at least for this podcast, our, our time is up. Um, thank you so much to both of you and particularly to Ashok for both attending the uh, podcast and also visiting us at Nupi. Thank you. Thank you.